Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Welcome to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips and ways that we can work in our daily lives to find that inner peace uh, for which we long. And on this podcast, I try to bring on guests who have also struggled with finding peace within their lives. And uh, in particular today, I'm uh, very pleased to have with us the CEO and founder of Your Tango, Andrea Miller. And Andrea has uh, written a book which has just been published called Radical Acceptance, The Secret to Happy, Lasting Love. And as we look at, you know, what is peacefulness in our lives, you know, relationships, uh, however they may look within our lives, are those things which can grant us a lot of peace. So I'm very uh, pleased that Andrea has taken the time out to be with us and to share a bit about her book and and what she has uh, learned along the way. So uh, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Chris. I'm so happy to be here. I love the podcast theme and glad to be able to contribute. Excellent. Uh, So if you can uh, tell a bit about yourself and, you know, kind of what got you into, uh, you know, what it is that you're doing now, um, Mm -hmm. that that would be helpful. Yeah, I would love to. Um, So my day job is as the CEO and founder of the number one digital publisher focused on love and relationship. That's Your Tango. And Your Tango is really the, has been the crucial catalyst to my becoming a successful author and in writing this incredible book. Um, And I would love to, Stephen, tell you a little bit about what got me started in media and as somebody Mm -hmm. who's dedicated the vast majority of her career to the topic of love and relationships because frankly my background was in engineering and finance um, before you know I got on this very yeah kind of very different circuitous path so I was in um, you know undergrad in mechanical engineering ended up um, sort of segueing into a, a finance job which had me working in Mumbai, India in the late 90s. And I was working with this incredible team of people and a lot of them had MBAs. And I, you know, always thought, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. So I thought, geez, I'd love to start my own business someday. Um, I also had always wanted to live in New York City. I was ready for a change. It was my mid 20s. And I thought, what if I could, you know, kind of pivot, go to business school and let that be my transition point. And so fortunately, Columbia Business School accepted me. And I was sitting in class one day, and I had this enormous epiphany where I realized when I looked at this incredibly crowded media landscape, that so much of it, when it comes to love and relationships, so much of it is, was then, and still often is, sadly, 59 ways to please your man, 17 ways into tricking him to propose to you, just lose 10 pounds and you'll be happy, right? I mean, all that stuff that preys on our insecurities makes us feel worse about ourselves. And that's often the, you know, what, what sort of, um, was, what was out there with the exception of, of course, like so many wonderful books from people like Harville Hendricks to John Gray, Helen Fisher, Pat Love, like those are the kinds of books that I love, but my, my logic was they're great. But, you know, often you read them, you put them back on the shelf, you go about your business and you start to slide back into your bad habits. So it just struck me with love being one of the most important, powerful things in the world and often the hardest to get right, especially when it comes to marriage. I thought, let me be the entrepreneur to prioritize love and put it in its rightful place as a media brand. And I've long described my vision is for your tango to be to love what ESPN is to sports. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so that got me on a media trajectory and I was over the moon and excited to launch. And so we launched, uh, in fact, as a national print magazine called Tango. And, but it was very much this idea of creating a media outlet that was predicated 
on editorial that was real, relatable, like the kind of conversations. Sure, some of us are lucky to have, you know, a wise sister, cousin, best friend, but it's, it's that kind of very conversational, very wise, hitting those emotional notes, coupled with, uh, we built a whole platform of experts, and I'm glad that you are counted among them, this whole Your Tango Experts platform where, where we said, let us find the best of the best in love, mental health, and relationships who can contribute to the editorial and who bring research and these incredible perspectives and who really are doing that the day-to-day work of reaching their clients and you know helping the world become a better place by their coaching and counseling, et cetera. And so, so as time went on, um, you know, we shifted from Tango as a print magazine to your Tango as a digital platform. And I'm, you know, I'm glad to say now that we've had all the success. We've got this, um, you know, a massive amount of uh, traffic that comes to the month, uh, comes to the site every month. And thanks to social media, as well as the incredible partnerships we have, we've got, you know, we just, we have this ability to reach a lot of people and it all comes back to in part what, in some ways, I, I have felt like we've been ahead of our time, and, and I promise this will segue back to radical acceptance in just a moment, um, you know, as, a, as a, a real distinction from when you look at the crowded media landscape, so much of what's out there is what's superficial and external, of how you look, like those things, and those things are bad, um, but if they're done to the exclusion of what's on the inside, it can be damaging or, you know, difficult. Um, so how we've really differentiated ourselves is to really look at what's going on in our and our audience's inner lives and really try to appeal mm-hmm. to our readers' hearts and minds. And sure, we all would love a beautiful new pair of shoes or a great looking handbag, but you're not going to find many handbags or shoes on our website. You will find much more in terms of just great advice and powerful means and thoughtful stories and incredible research. And, and so much of it has come through the, the, the filter of a conversational voice. And so even, you know, even sometimes having the brightest PhD or the most astute expert who's got all the credentials, well, if he or she isn't communicating in a way that's relatable to our user, um, that even though they may be very passionate and very informed, that message probably isn't going to translate. So, right. and, and that's very much the, the thinking that I had going into my book you know, and I'll, I'll segue here. So I just had this big epiphany, you know, recognizing I was, um, I'll tell a, a brief story. I was with my, he, he was then my boyfriend, now my husband, wringing my hand, you know, we lived together, we loved each other. This was many years ago, but I just, ah, oh, what to do, what to do. And, you know, I love him, but we fight, ah, oh, you know, all that mm-hmm. angst that so many of us can relate to. And I had a wise friend who I called up and she just said, Andrea, she said three powerful words, Andrea, just love him. And it was that, that stopped me in my tracks. It was like, oh my God, it's, I don't want to say that easy, but that's simple. It was like, Mm -hmm. oh my God, yes, that, that's what I need to do. Like I need just to kind of let go of all this other noise and anxiety and um, just focus on that. And what I found is that, even though I, I felt like we were committed, but there was still an escape hatch of some sort opened in my mind and, and it became wide open when we had a fight or I was feeling badly or whatever the case may be. So I realized when I just committed to just love him, and in fact, I talked in the book, I've got five steps to radical acceptance, which I'll come back to. Step one is just love him or just dump him, right? This idea of being either be in and fully committed to the person in your life or or, or don't have that relationship because to right. be in the middle and to make it conditional is um, not a great place to be. So that was a big foundational seed. I said, okay, I'm going to just love him. But, you know, fate would have it as time went on. I was committed to that and it helped, but honestly, it wasn't enough. And I just, I was like, oh, okay, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just loving him. I'm looking for the future and I'm really trying to do this. Um, what struck me as time went on, and I've got, as I describe, uh, I've got the most brilliant, charming, generous, kind, wonderful husband in the world, except for when he's not, and then I want to kill him, right? I mean, we can all relate to that. And mm-hmm. um, and he is a proud Virgo, which I eventually found, um, I didn't realize this for a long time, that Virgos tend to be very critical. 
right? And so I was like, oh my God, I, I remember having this moment. It was very meta. And I said to him, oh my God, it's you, not me, right? Because I was so used to him criticizing me all the time. And I just said, that's who he is, right? And mm-hmm. I can either continue to rail against that and feel badly and to overlook all those good things and focus on this thing that's hard for me. Or I can say, you know what, that's part of who he is. And, and, and frankly, his being so critical and, and perfectionistic has served him and has served me in many ways. So as time went on, it just struck me to summarize this. As time went on, I realized I can't just love the lovable part. He's charming. He's brilliant. He's generous. He's kind. I needed to love all of him. And I realized mm-hmm. this mistake that I was making is incredibly common, where we want our partners to be how we want them. You know, we want to cherry pick the parts that we like and then just say, hey, all those things that are hard that I don't like, can you go away, please? Um, and, and that's, I mean, it's crazy, right? And it's like, why isn't this common knowledge? I mean, maybe in a way, somewhere in our, the recesses of our mind, we know better, but it's not a common practice. And, you know, it, it's like, don't take my word for it. Just look at the 45% divorce rate to see how tough having a, a lasting successful marriages. And so I just, I started putting the pieces together and by virtue of immersing myself as a professional in media and, and particularly love and relationships and getting to see the work of experts like you, Chris, as well as others like Stan Tatkin and Helen Fisher and just all this great data. It was like, let me connect the dots and figure out what's going to work for me. And as time went on, I just, I felt like I was in this um, petri dish or crucible and just practicing these things and working on these things and you know kind of with that original epiphany saying all right just love him okay got it now what if I really learned to love his unlovable parts what would that be like right so I you know it's like I was I've been doing this thing for 10 years and at uh, some point I'm not positive when it was I called it radical acceptance. And it was just kind of this thing that I did. And I counseled people informally. And I, you know, I just started observing, what are those steps that I'm taking? And what's working? And, you know, eventually, this all came together. And if you'll kind of uh, rewind to about four years ago, I started working. And, I, and meanwhile, I've got this wonderful board of directors and these people that are advisors in my life. And they kept saying, you got to write a book, you got to write a book. And of course, it's never convenient to write a book. It was like, well, Mm-mm. I'm pregnant. And okay, don't write a book when you're pregnant. You're far too busy. And then it's like, but I'm pregnant again. And then it's like, no, 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 no. You know, and then finally, I'm like, all right, <laughs> there are no more kids coming. It's never convenient to write a book. Like, I just, I have to clear the decks and make this happen. And so I started working on um, on the proposal and just continuing to fine tune this approach and write about it. And I got a, you know, I was very lucky. I got an amazing agent from ICM. Um, She, and then she really put me through my paces for anybody listening to this who aspires to write a book. You know, if you think by the time your agent gets your um, winning book proposal that, you know, you're ready to go to market, you probably want to revisit that expectation because as much time and effort as I put into the proposal, it was another six months of very, very intense writing and editing and expanding and collaborating that finally got me ready for market it was worth every bit of effort and she kept telling me it would be she kept saying andrea i know you're in the pain cave and i'm so sorry and i was like you are so old you know killing me but yes okay i trust you and we're, we're on this journey and you know and again for anybody who's aspires to write a book um the idea of just writing the best most thorough most true to what you want to do book proposal not only will help it sell and may even get multiple authors uh, multiple offers which is what happened to me and I can come back to that in a minute but it it makes it so much easier when you sit down and you're like oh my god now I've got to write 100,000 words or even 60,000 words it's really daunting but I had this incredible proposal in front of me and I you know was a first-time author and it was like okay I've got an introduction great I've got a couple of sample chapters great. I've got an outline of um, chapter summaries, you know, chapters one through 10. Um, now I can just sit down and go, okay, well, well, how did I summarize this? Whew. Like, mm-hmm. I can start fleshing this out. And one step at a time, I will, ha- I will write a beautiful book. And that, so that was a, 
the process. And then eventually, you know, so fast forward to the point where we were ready to bring it to market. And I was very lucky to have around seven or eight um, uh, bids on it. So uh, thankfully a uh, bidding war ensued. And um, I was really excited that I got the um, publisher that I'd always hoped for, which is the Atria division of Simon & Schuster. The whole team there has been great. They've just been so supportive and passionate about what I wrote and my vision. And, and probably the thing that is, was most gratifying in that whole process is that I would show up at these meetings. I mean, I'm a grown woman with you know a meaningful amount of success, et cetera, under my belt, and these people wanted to meet me. But it was like being kind of a, a nervous kid showing up in these <laughs> you know, kind of big, uh, you know, in many cases, kind of uh, grandiose uh, publishing offices and, you know, having these editors and publicists like, oh my gosh, we just, we loved your proposal and we, you know, we're practicing radical acceptance on ourselves and our mother-in-laws and our husbands and our spouses and, uh, you know, on and on and on. What, what was very remarkable to me and what made me really believe that much more in, in what I was doing with how I walked into these meetings and the response was so positive out of the gate, right? Just on the basis of the proposal, it was like, you've taken something that, you know, let's face it, there are a lot of books in the, in the love and self-help space. It's, it's not easy to find something that feels fresh and big um, and really accessible. So what, you know, what I kept hearing is, Oh my gosh, this, this is all of those things and we're practicing it and we get it. And it. And it's like this, um, it's like this um, game changer, right? Because like once you get it, you're like, oh my gosh, I get this. You just, you find that it changes everything. And, and so let me tell you a little bit about what radical acceptance is now that I've kind of described the process. So, um, and then of course I spent two years writing the book and researching and finally got it um, to market and it went on sale just a few weeks ago. And so what radical acceptance is, the simple explanation is learning to replace judgment with compassion and empathy. Um, you know, and I hearken back to the unlovable parts of my partner, Sanjay, my husband. And what I had to do and what I figured out was incredibly self-serving. It was good for me. It was good for him. It was good for our relationship was instead of when he was critical of me or he lost his temper or any number of things that were painful or that I wanted to reject or blame um, that I really just said, oh, and say and, and try. And, and it still is a process and sometimes still a, a challenge. But instead of saying, oh my gosh, I'm going to reject those things and I'm going to get mad and I'm going to defend and deflect. How can I take a breath and um, rather than judge, try to say, okay, how can I be compassionate here? How can I understand him a little bit better? Um, and so, so it's a pretty, you know, similar to even the just, just love him. It's a pretty simple idea. Um, not necessarily easy to practice, but that's, mm -hmm. that's really the, the thrust of it that, um, you know, that it really is about how we can love our partners. But of course, you know, ding, ding, ding. What I found out in this journey is it was as much about loving his unlovable parts as it was about loving my own unlovable parts and coming to terms with that and recognizing even how often his unlovable parts were magnified because of my own behavior. Um, I'm a workaholic and it's really a thing. It's, you know, I, I know people kind of say that flippantly, but for me, it really is a thing. And I've, you know, put a lot of other important people and priorities in, in my life, you know, way on the back burner or off, you know, you know, out of the kitchen, frankly, um, to pursue my work and, and my ambitions. And when I did that in my marriage, I mean, it, predictably, my husband felt really bad. And he would, mm -hmm. his lonely would turn into anger, and his anger would turn into criticism. And, you know, our arguments over the dishwasher would become biblical, because it wasn't about the dishwasher. It was, I don't feel loved enough by you. And he wouldn't feel loved enough by me. And guess what? I wouldn't feel loved enough by him. He would make me really mad, you know, because I'd feel like, well, all you do is criticize me. Well, of course, all he's going to do is criticize me if he's not feeling, you know, valued or prioritized. So this whole thing was like this crazy downward um, spiral. And, and as I like to say, I came to the very last possible conclusion. Like I'm a 
you know, type A, very analytical engineer, and was like, okay, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? <laughs> Last possible conclusion was, I need to change, right? Rather than railing against him, wanting him to change, wanting to point the finger at him. Um, and that, you know, it, ultimately that's what led to, okay, I need to start learning to love his unlovable parts and, and how that then, as I really sought to do that, and I really sought to open my own heart and my own mind to say, how do I unlove, unlove his unlovable parts? He's a really unlovable, like, how can I possibly do this? Mm -hmm. um, it was then that, okay, you know, my own, so many more of my own um, shortcomings and uh feelings of inadequacy and, and the things that were preventing me from being a better partner to him and, and tending to um, kind of, you know, focus so much on my work and push him away, et cetera. So it became this very much a, from, you know, a, a um, vicious downward cycle where not feeling loved begot more not feeling loved. What I really tried to do was in part a virtuous cycle where I tried to, tune much more into him and look at my own shortcomings and say, well, where am I part of the problem and how can I start being more of the solution and, mm -hmm. and where can I be more empathetic with myself, right? Because it's so, you know, again, it's so easy to blame and um, deflect, but underneath a lot of that was, okay, I need to come to grips with the things that are preventing me from being more open, you know, and, and being more resourceful when it came to our challenges. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of that just ended up coming together. And that's um, how, long story short, how Radical Acceptance was born. And, and, and that, that's an awesome story because what I, I really enjoy is it goes from, you know, your whole other career and other life, so to speak, and into what this is now. And for me, that gives, you know, this book and uh, you know, and it makes sense, you know, as, as I read the book now, you know, that the, this realism, because it's coming from a place of, you know, experience, not just the theory. And that's something that oh, I'm totally. always big on. Yeah. It, you know, that the more that we can share with other people, what's, you know, really the experiences versus, well, you know, here, here's this nice pie in the sky theory, which is needed in certain fields but um you know when you talk about the you know the notions that you've been mentioning and how um you know it seems so common sense that why don't we get it you know what well, why don't we just you know love and why don't we just do certain things and i think because it is so commonsensical we we miss it because we're looking for that deeper you know we we want these deep theories and and these you know, like ethereal answers when maybe the answer is just very concrete and very practical. Um, so yeah, it, exactly. And in part, in part, I, I, I hinted at that even when we first started speaking is that one of the things that I've realized, and I give full props to the incredible contributors on the Your Tango team who are often so brave in telling stories that are filled with either uncomfortable truths or maybe unpopular opinions or experiences that are really, really personal. And it's scary because you feel so vulnerable. But what I realized is in part because there are a million, maybe even more, I don't know, but there are a lot of books out there on love and relationships. I do give great advice. I've read almost all of them and I admire these people. And I've frankly, I've been so blessed to have a lot of this great leadership, uh, thought leadership and, and research in my book. But what I really felt strongly about in terms of differentiating it and um, making it as, as relatable and as accessible and immediate to the reader as I could was to write it in a way that was very conversational. And probably some of the best feedback that I've gotten are people will say things, oh my gosh, this book practically reads itself. And it feels like you're talking to me. It feels like we're having a conversation, which is such a gift because that was very deliberate. I mean, in part of it's very deliberate, um, but also just a little shout out to those of you who might want to write a book. That's how I found my voice. Like it was just really natural for me to write that way. And again, not having been an author or not even frankly a prolific writer, that was a little bit scary. But when I sat down to do this, it was like, that's what was natural to me. And, and in part, I think what was natural was also shaped to a certain degree by seeing how that conversational approach 
works really well on your tango because it's like it makes it fun to read it makes it more relatable and ultimately sure i mean it's it's great to have somebody's attention and, and it's flattering to get to write a book but i wrote this book to change the world right i wrote this book so people will read it and go oh my gosh she is talking to me and i'm going to act on this like i always talk about actionable advice like advice means nothing if it's not actionable right i mean and and of course i i talk a lot in the book about how practice 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 how i'm putting this out there i'm telling these stories and not just my own i've been blessed with because i've been developing this over so many years that i have so many anecdotes and stories that people who i'd counseled or who had been practicing radical acceptance um were able to use it and explain how it transformed their relationship and there's um it, you know it well the book is written very deliberately in a heterosexual because i'm a married woman um uh, married to a man um kind of a, a heterosexual girlfriend to girlfriend tone because i thought oh my god if everything is gender neutral and pronouns galore mm -hmm. then it's going to make for tiresome reading but i say in numerous times throughout the book no matter what your gender orientation is no matter what your sexual orientation is no matter what your religion race wherever you're coming from it comes down to love and it comes down to how we can love ourselves and those around us as they are right here right now not how we want them to be and that i mean right. that has been hugely echoed to me like people are right to me and they're like oh my god you've changed my life because I've taken to heart that I need to love the people around me as they are and not how I want them to be. Right. And it's like the most obvious thing in the world, but it's not <laughs> right. Or it's the most <laughs> obvious thing, but few of us practice that. I mean, we just sit there like, in fact, uh, Harville Hendricks, I talked about this in the book when he and I sat down, Harville and, and his wife, Helen McKelly Hunt, we sat down and he talked about a thing called symbiotic consciousness. And that's basically a fancy way of saying, it's like unconsciously we expect people to think and behave like we do, right? So it's like, well, of course we're gonna feel mad or uncomfortable or agitated or whatever um, when our partners say or do something or frankly our, our parents or our kids or our friends that you know we don't like or we don't ex mm -hmm. you know don't expect or, or whatever the case may be. And there is a kind of a fundamental underlying I don't know that it's biological, but there's a fundamental underlying, very predictable thing that causes that. And so, again, it was like, oh, my God, why, don't, why aren't we all taught about um, symbiotic consciousness where, when we're in kindergarten and like, right. hey, you're going to keep running into this thing. And I know our, my kids are in first grade and preschool, so I'm like in that mode and I'm trying to teach my kids, you know, all the good things. But this idea of just saying, you know, peop, you have to expect people are going to be different. And that's okay. And, um, and that's fundamentally what, you know, what really helped me have this breakthrough, both in the style of, of writing to make it conversational and make it relatable. But, you know, in some ways, you know, kind of more importantly, just as far as what the idea was, was to say, how can we really meet the people that we care about in our lives, where they are, right, rather than just continuing to feel you know, gnash our teeth and, and feel anxious and mad and hurt and disappointed when they're not how we want them to be or right. whatever the case is. And I should add very crucially and very fundamentally, I spend, you know, so there's the introduction, chapter one is kind of an overview of the book. I In chapter two, I talk about red flags and I always like to emphasize this because never do I want anybody anywhere to use radical acceptance as a rationale or a rationalization to be in a bad relationship. And so I really mm. painstakingly go through from the fact that one out of uh, four women are going to be abused sexually, emotionally, physically at some point in their life. Um, and, and just the different forms of dysfunction and, and, and just challenging scenarios that don't merit radical acceptance. And frankly, I talk about gray areas. There are certain mental health areas that it, it's not a deal killer, but radical acceptance may or may not help you. Addiction. I mean, frankly, in some ways, radical acceptance may be damaging. I mean, it's like I, having, you know, come from a family where there's a decent amount of addiction. In AA parlance, that's called enabling, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
so I, I use I always use those cautions, but but say for for the most you know the, the rest of us who have a normal degree of dysfunction and we all do, and a normal degree of you know kind of everything else, we're not in a dangerous situation. We're not being we're not with a you know lunatic uh, <laughs> that's in radical acceptance. It is is appropriate, but it's a practice, right? I mean, it's like it's a, and I always say it's like it's a great theory. It's a wonderful theory. Everybody can agree to the theory. So that's not the point. It's are you willing to practice it? And right. if you are, you will find that it will one hundred and fifty percent. It will transform not only your life, but very likely in in you know marginal and maybe even profound ways, the people around you, right? I mean, a lot of people will say to me, "Well, what if I practice radical acceptance and he doesn't get it?" Or he doesn't reciprocate. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. First of all, you know, my advice is always um, be willing to go 150% in the relationship. Don't sit around keeping score. Don't sit around waiting tit for tat. I do this. He does that. Oh, I took out the garbage. You know, he needs to make them. Mm -hmm. Like, forget that. Right now, of course. Again, do I, am I saying that, you know, you should be habitually manipulated and um, your husband or girlfriend should never pull their weight? No, of course not. But the problem is we can't, so many of us can't get out of the gate because we're waiting for that other person to make the first move. It's like, right. come on, people, it's crazy. So <laughs> I always say love starts with you, right? Like give it, give it freely, say to yourself, I'm going to go 150% of the way for this relationship, for this person that's important to me. And either one or two things are likely to happen. You're going to either find after a certain amount of time, and I can't give a, prescribed amount of time, but let's say a handful of months, maybe you just say, I'm going to go to the mat. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, do it, do it, do it. And you do it. And this person never shows up and they habitually manipulate you. Chances are you're in a deal breaker situation, right? Mm -hmm. And, and chances are you knew that. And chances are a lot of this was already, if it wasn't at the surface, it was bubbling pretty, you know, heartily underneath the surface. Right. So in that case, I say it's uh, heartbreak. Sure. But, at the same time, at least you know, and at least you can say to yourself, if you have to part ways, I truly did everything I could. I went to the end of the earth. I love this person to the best of my ability, and I might be mad, and I might be heartbroken, but I can leave in good, clean conscience, not wondering, should I have done more, right? right. And so to me, that is a great gift. That's the unfortunate scenario. The much more common scenario is the one that I'm hearing about again and again, and especially now that the books out there are and, and living a life of its own, um, what I'm hearing again and again, people are saying to me, oh my gosh, I'm practicing radical acceptance. And it's amazing to me how my partner gets it and how my partner is like, you know, really kind of stepping up and not because I'm asking him or her to, and not because I'm, um, you know, like expecting this change or insisting on change. I'm just doing my part and I'm doing my part with a more open heart, with a more open mind, with a little more grace, a little more generosity. I'm not waiting for them to reciprocate that very minute, right? A lot of times we just are our own worst enemies. And so it's like that change and that love and that bit of like that, you know, I always, it's like in part I talk a lot in the book about how um, 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 brain science is, is on the side of love. And I, by that I mean that we are you know, our brains are plastic and, and we, if we just continue to practice something and, and commit to something, those neural networks will support us. And, um, you know, commitment can become, you know, commitment can become practice, can become habit, can become instinct. And so this idea of saying, I'm going to make a commitment to radical acceptance and I'm going to practice it and it's going to become a habit and it's going to become an instinct. And it's just, and I'm not saying every single time and I still mess up. Right. So I'm not saying that this is like this magic bullet that you just commit to it and voila. But I am saying that the, the commitment and the habit and the practice can become so overarching in our lives. And, and it just, it's like by virtue of us changing. Right. So I said, I came to one possible conclusion. What can I do? I can change. Oh, well, amazing. Imagine that when I change in such a powerful and positive way, because I'm with a good man, um, he changed, right? He started stepping up more and guess what? He started becoming 
ding, 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 less critical, right? I mean, it's like exactly. I got what I wanted, but not because I insisted on change and not because I railed against what I didn't like. It was the opposite. I mean, and so kind of back to the idea of inner peace, it's like, like that inner peace is there for us. And, and, you know, frankly, I feel like, especially if you have kids, um, radical acceptance is even more important in your, um, you know, marriage or in your domestic partnership, if you have children, because our kids deserve the best parents that we can be and the best parents we can, can be. Yes, of course, teaching them piano and sending them to a great school and all those things are important too. But as parents, giving them role models of people who love and respect and prioritize each other is so important. And, um, and so this idea of just being able to give that to them to me is, um, you know, it's really crucial. So anyway, I, as you can tell, Chris, I can talk for days. I feel like <laughs> it's just been like such a, a, a cool experience. But oh, and in fact, just bringing that back, that point back. So this idea of inner peace, you know, I mean, a lot of homes are filled with a lot of chaos and conflict. And particularly if you have little kids like I do, we adore our children. They are wonderful. But four and seven year old boys create their own massive amount of chaos. Oh, so yes. I feel like I've really brought such a gift to my family and my husband has totally stepped it up. You know, as I've brought the radical acceptance framework and practice to our family, um, it's it's made a very meaningful difference. I mean, a transformational difference. And so I feel like if you want inner peace, um, it's, you know, it's like Gandhi said, um, uh, what is it? Be the change you want to see in the world. Mm-hmm. I say, give the love you want to feel in the world. Right. And don't wait for it. Don't wait for something else. Go first. And right. that's scary. I know a lot of people feel very nervous. They think, oh, am I going to be a sucker, right? Am I going to be like, hey, why did you do that, dummy? No, love is never wasted, right? And if somebody doesn't reciprocate after all you've done, like I said, then you know, right? Worst case exactly. is, you know. But in all likelihood, they are going to respond. And you're going to be like, oh, my God, I'm a genius. I loved a lot. And now guess what? I'm getting so much love back. Isn't that great? Well, and, um, and yeah. it's... It's so much, you know, when you look at what you're saying here and you look at the book, it's very empowering. And that's one of the things that I really like because, you know, you're not sitting there, you know, trying to say, well, here's a problem and put people down or blame or, you know, whatever. But it becomes an empowering because I think what many of us miss when we talk about love and what love is, is we miss the action piece. You know, we, we romanticize love as, as this ethereal entity, but it's really a down-to-earth action. And a lot of what I've seen in, in my practice and, and, you know, personally and all that is, you know, when, when you miss the action piece, that's really yeah. when you end up missing that, that depth of, of what the love is. Totally. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's, you know, in part that's, you know, I just, I was really so deliberate with how I wrote this to try to tell stories and make it actionable and and underpin it with really good research so that someone could sit down and go, wow, okay. You know, she, she really is talking to me and I really can do something with this. And, you know, a lot of people are telling me that they're reading it, you know, very deliberately a chapter at a time and not blazing through it because in part, in part, it's easy to read, but in part, it's also dense. I mean, there's a lot of really good information. In fact, there's a lot of cool science in there um, that I very deliberately put a lot of that in sidebars. For you science wonks and nerds, you're going to love it. Mm-hmm. But for people who are like, mm, not so much, that's not really my thing, um, just you know, blow past it because if, if, you, if you are interested, it's great and it's there, but it's not, um, you know, it's, it's by no means imperative. But, you know, in part, it was just a very deliberate, very caring approach to go, okay, how can I, between, you know, the voice and, and, and tone and narrative, coupled with the research and these other stories, how can I kind of put it together so that it, it does make a positive impact in people's lives if they practice it? And that's, you know, kind of right. back to the, that's how, how, you know, that's how you affect change, right? It's not going to happen spontaneously. Well, exactly. And, and it, it does need that choice, you know, and, and that's what I think you're saying in that deliberateness, you know, we, we need to choose to act in a certain way and, and take those actions. And when we do, we're going to get something back. Uh, totally. You know, yep. So, yeah. That, but, that, and, but that's even, even then, you know, it's like this idea of how long should I wait? Like, depending on where 
you are in your relationship, you know, I know I've got some friends that are married that are really struggling. They're like, oh my God, I'm at the end of my rope. How can radical accept, acceptance help me? And I'm like, hey sister, hang on. Like if you've been married, especially if you have kids, why not? What do you have to mm-hmm. do? Now, again, if there's abuse, if there's some, you know, right. okay, now we're not talking, but if it's just, I'm mad at him. He's mad at me. I don't feel loved enough. This sucks. Like, just try it. It's like, if you've been together that long, give radical acceptance a chance. Like really with your whole heart, mind, and being, do it for three months and don't expect three months for it to be perfect. Expect in three months or two months or four months, expect to see positive signals. Expect to see enough that gives you hope that you can say, whew, I'm going to keep doing this. Right. And it may happen much sooner, but if it's like a, a lot of marriages that, you know, have been languishing over time, um, it may take a little bit longer, right? I mean, but as I described a few minutes ago, some, even for people who have been married for a while, and things are, you know, they're okay. They're not necessarily great or horrible, but they could probably use a little more TLC. I mean, these stories are phenomenal. People are like, it is amazing to me how I started doing this. In fact, I, I encouraged a bunch of readers to do a radical acceptance 60 day challenge where it's like read the book and then commit yourself no matter what 60 days, just practice it, just do it Mm -hmm. right. There's no downside. And you know, I mean, so often in those cases, virtually in every case, I mean, and I had couples doing it. I had 21 year old single gals who are in college were saying, okay, I'm doing this with my friends, you know, all these different scenarios where radical acceptance can be applied. Um, it, it was really pretty phenomenal for these people who said, all right, I'm going to take this. I don't even know what this is, but I'm going to take it on. I'm going to try this crazy thing you're telling me to do. And sure enough, it's like if you really commit yourself and just say, I'm committed to change and I'm going to do it for 60 days, that um, magic happens. So right. anyway, it's, it's been very gratifying to give birth to something that as people practice it, they're finding it works. So, and I would preface this by the obvious thing is to go out and buy the book, which I do encourage people <laughs> thank to do. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. But how might someone who's listening to this, you know, who says, hey, you know, that this is sounding excellent. And then, you know, I, I love the passion behind this. And then let's, mm-hmm. you know, I, I want to jump and do this. What, mm-hmm. what might be a start that someone can say, all right, right now, when I finish with uh, listening to this, I'm going to mm-hmm. go and start radical acceptance. Um, totally. And like I say, of course, buy the book is one of those. But yeah, yeah, yeah. before you go and buy it, like, like what, what can you do to, to start this process? Well, there are a couple things. One is there's your tango.com that has a lot of radical acceptance editorial. In fact, if you look, there's, you go to the site, radical acceptance, or excuse me, your tango.com, you'll see a little button on the right that says radical acceptance. You can click through to that and find a ton of content. And then similarly, I've got another site called radicalacceptance.love, um, dot L-O-V-E. Uh, I love that little, rather than, who, who needs a dot com? Nice. You can get dot love, right? Isn't that good? Exactly. Um, Never heard of that one. That, that's cool. I know. I know. I was like, that is too cool. And so, so I've got some great articles on that. In fact, there's one article, uh, one essay in particular that you'll be able to easily find that's a very personal essay about my radical acceptance journey from, you know, summarizing some of the things that we're talking about, Chris, and then laying out those five steps. So somebody could, you know, listening could go, okay, you know, what are those five steps? And, you know, talk to me a little bit about um, how to practice them. So I would say, you know, just reading a little bit more of the writing, but I think, you know, in terms of other things that are actionable, you know, really starting with the, with the step one, if you're with somebody right now, if you're in a relationship I would say this idea of just starting with just love him or her um, is, is a powerful game changer. And the, you know, the counterpoint, just love him or just dump him. It's like, if you can't, if you keep finding yourself resisting, why can't I just love him? Well, that's a, that's a big signal, right? If you're really honest with yourself and you can't make that commitment, um, well, then you need to really explore and ask yourself why. I'll give you two kind of two provisos here. One is, If you're dating and you don't know and, you know, you guys have been together for a few months, by all means, keep dating. Don't don't feel like you need to make that commitment prematurely. But if you've been together for a while, if you're married, I mean, you know, it's like, okay, we're we're in this. Really. 
commit yourself to making that determination. And if you can't, then, then you really need to buy the book. No, you know, in all seriousness, then, then you really need to be very introspective and say, I can't commit to this person. And, you know, of course, my pretty um, brutal advice is we'll just dump him. If you're not ready to do that, then you, then something else is warranted. Then you really have to ask why. And for people who are maybe single and going on dates and, um, you know, they're trying to find a lasting relationship, I modify the just love him and I say just like him, right? Because it's like we all know that it's in this day of endless dating apps and endless, you know, uh, pools of people to date, dating has gotten harder than ever. And sure, there are all sorts of examples of I got married for my Tinder date and I got married for my eHarmony date. Great, congratulations. But for so many other people, it's like um, it's like the um, the paradox of choice, right? We've heard about the paradox of choice. If there are too many choices, either we don't make a decision or we just keep thinking there's a better one out there, right? And so I, I talk in the book about these people who will go on date after date after date but they're almost always, you know, it's like you heard of the one hit wonder. They're all one hit wonders. Um, and, and maybe not so wonderful right. that never lead to second or third date. So I say, just find a reason to like him unless or her. If, if this person is repellent, okay, fine. But not everybody can be repellent. If you, you know, and it's so often we want sparks and fireworks out of the gate. And sure, it's great if you can get it. But sometimes those sparks and fireworks out of the gate can lead to, I mean, I always talk about my husband. I mean, we have fireworks of the best and worst kind, right? It's like mm -hmm. that passion can go both ways. So it's great if you can get it. We all love romantic love, but it doesn't mean I talk a great, there's a great example in the book about a woman who was so not into this guy. I mean, it's like he pursued her and on and off and not very much and she, whatever. They ended up crossing paths again on the beach. They're out, they live out on the West Coast. And second time around, she was like, oh, my God, I missed a lot the first time around. And the first time around, she had just gotten over a breakup and this and that. And long story short, it's like they are married and have this epic relationship. He is the love of her life. But it didn't happen out of the gate, right? It's like she learned to love him. She got to know him. She just liked him. You know what I mean? Like, she just liked right. him. And that was the, that was the starting point. And that's why I, I know that it, it's, it can be so frustrating to be dating in 2017, but that's where I just say, just like him and try not to have this big expectation out of the gate that it's going to be this magical experience because it may take time to, to develop the magic. I always say soulmates are made, they are not born. And so um, anyway, those are just a few, few thoughts that I hope will help your listeners. Oh, definitely. And, and, you know, I think once we can really make that shift within our perspective and, and, you know, as we're saying, really jump into the fact of I'm going to take some action on this, uh, that that's going to make, you know, the, uh, the big difference, uh, you know, in, in how the relationships are. Um, totally. So for people who now do want to buy the book, which again, I mm -hmm. encourage people to do so. What's the, Thank uh, you places that they can find your book or, or the best place to go to get more info. Yeah, totally. Thanks so much for asking. Um, you know, the obvious, the, the big BMS, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, but as an entrepreneur, there is a soft spot in my heart for independent bookstores. So if you live in New York City, where we live, um, book culture is wonderful. They're stocking it. A lot of other mm -hmm. Uh, there's a place called the Bookworm in Vail, just near Vail, Colorado. We go out to Vail all the time, and they're carrying my book, which I'm so grateful for. Um, so there are a lot of, of independent bookstores. Um, so yeah, you know, there are a few places that have yet to carry it. I'm not going to um, name names, but we're hoping those places will um, start to pick it up too as uh, time goes on. Well, as people go to their local bookstores, then they should start asking for it, and these places are going to totally. start, you know, yes. picking it up. Yep. Thank you, Chris. Totally. We'll, we'll start a movement and get people out there. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, I want to thank you again for, you know, sharing with us your, your insights on, on this topic and for, you know, all that you're doing and, you know, the, the passion that we can sense from how engaged you are with this really translates into the book and, you know, really, uh, uh, again, encourage people go and get the book. Um, you know, practice what's in the book and life will be wonderful. But, uh, 
So uh, again, thank you for taking the time and uh, really appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. It's been fun talking to you and I hope this helps. And if anybody does read it and want to get back to me, you can find me at Andrea at radicalacceptance.love if you want to email me or on Twitter and Facebook. I always love to hear from people who've read it. Perfect. Excellent. Cool. All right. Thank you. Right, I appreciate it, Chris. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.